when I was 20, I thought, oh my God, I'm going to make it by the time I'm 30. When I was 30, I thought, oh shit, I can keep on bluffing till I'm 40. But after that, I thought, fuck it, I'm just going to do what pleases me. And if the world likes it, great. My best memory, I've done lots of recordings in lots of studios. Some were really shitty, some were more like upmarket. But I guess the golden one was with the producer Vic Mail, who also produced a lot of bands I like, Motorhead, Dr Feelgood and so on. I was doing an album with a band called The Birdhouse in the mid-late 80s. A lot of egos in that band, but he always praised what I was doing and that really meant something to me. The best concert was the first concert with my punk band, The Accelerators, and that really set the standard for everything else. And I don't think I've ever really got up to the exact level of that. There was just so much adrenaline. Back then it was really something new. I mean, nowadays bands have like fake Marshall stacks and all kinds of crap and they think that attitude is something you get with an app on a smartphone. But back then it was real and it was new and it was a very good time to be alive. And it's worth being old now for the fact that I was around in that time, 1977. When I write a song, I don't just sit there and think, OK, I'm going to write a song, it doesn't work like that. I believe, I don't know how it works, but the song is actually in my subconscious waiting to be retrieved. When I was at school, I was told I couldn't sing, which is not a very good thing to be told. I never had any formal vocal coaching. I never went to any choir. So as a vocalist, I'm mainly self-taught. Whether that's good or bad, I can't say. But I guess in a way it might make my singing more individual. I guess my real schooling was with punk. I remember sitting in the garage and trying to play downstrokes for hours on end till my hands were really dropping off. That's like the real punk style. My clock kind of stopped for influences around the mid 70s, I have to admit. And I liked bands that weren't pretentious like Motorhead or ACDC. More recently, I got more into swing, rockabilly and country music because it's universal people saying directly from the heart what they want to say. As a musician, of course, I have to work with a lot of other musicians and it's just like the world in general. Some people are arseholes and very difficult to work with and some people are really nice. And I can tell you a little story, no names mentioned, of playing in a bar somewhere in Neukölln and there was this band with a very pretentious name. Again, I won't say, but it was some stupid name like Pink Jelly or something. They had a real diva. I think she played the fiddle and sang, but mainly it was just samples. They weren't really playing their instruments. I'd set everything up. I'd got the voice exactly the level I wanted, and I'd done my little sound check. And then she came along and she stuck her mic into the same mic socket that I'd used. I said, hey, wouldn't it be an idea to use a different one so you can get your sound? And she goes, oh, whatever. That's what I mean by some people are arseholes, but others are really good. And I've got like a circle of friends that we trade places to gig, we help each other out, and you kind of figure it out pretty quickly and you stick with the people you get on with. I can't stop playing music. I wish I could sometimes because that's what I do. It'd be like saying, can you stop being Kathy Freeman. I strive to be honest. Sometimes I have to check myself and say, oh Christ, that was a load of bullshit, try again. For years and years and years, I used to think I have to aspire to be like this person or that person. And I finally realized that actually it's about being myself, not being anyone else. That's really the only way to be as straight and direct as I can. A real music career, I guess, would be doing music 24-7 and making a shed load of money out of it. I can't isolate any one moment where I said, this is it, this is making it, this is where I want to be. But I guess the best moment is when you're on stage and everyone's into what you're doing and you've got that communication. I think people usually get what I'm doing when I play a song, even if people don't get 
the finer points, they get the idea, they get the drift and they get the energy. If someone says success, I think of kind of cartoon cliches like a big man with a cigar and a bag full of money and stuff like that. It just seems very abstract. But when I think about it a bit deeper, I guess success is actually managing to do what you really want and to really be yourself because the whole world's trying to put you in some kind of fucking box most of the time. And if you can stay out of that box, that's like a good way to being successful. <laughs> very small. A friend of my dad, he, he died quite young and he left my dad some albums, one of which was High Tide and Green Grass by the Rolling Stones and that had satisfaction on it. 
And when you hear satisfaction as a child, it's quite interesting. It was for me um, because it's it's good, but it's not it's not pretty. You know, it's not nice. It's an interesting thing as a child to hear something that's good, but it's not nice. You know, I think that's the moment of discovery of rock and roll. It's mean, something good, but mean. So that was my rock and roll epiphany moment. Yeah. With my old band, Two Dollar Bash, we made our third album in a, an old farmhouse in a village in the Czech Republic called Vratno. The guy who was looking after it was drinking window cleaner and he, uh, he smelled really bad, this guy. I mean, this is coming from a traveling musician, right? This, you know, we, we cleaned all the cat shit out of the place and then we turned it into a studio and we made my the Lost River album. One, one concert that stands out is the Elysee Montmartre in Paris, which is just a very grand old theatre, a couple of hundred years old, the decor and everything. And, and we were opening for a very popular hip band at the time, so there was like a couple of thousand people there, and just to play in this very grandiose surrounding in Montmartre in Paris. It's great. I've always found writing tunes very easy. Writing words is, is much more difficult for me. When I was learning music, I was hanging around with some, some friends that I still play music with. Just happened to be friends who were extremely talented songwriters. I mean, it's a blessing, but it's, it's also a curse. If lyrics come less naturally to you, you're always comparing yourself. Instead of just getting on, trying slowly to get good, you're, you're trying to be great like the other people around you. And that can really, um, um, it can paralyze you, you know. I came to the conclusion, listening to music that I'm into and listening to the words, even though the sound is great, sometimes the words are not that great, they're just okay, but it's the actual overall sound and the combination of everything which turns out to be great. What I try and do now is just not be shit. That's my motto, just don't be shit. I mean, sometimes people say nice things about my music. I don't think you can ever really know. If people say nice things about it, then it's, it really is a nice, rewarding feeling. And when you're playing in a rock and roll band, if people are dancing, you feel vindicated and you feel like, it's great, you know. When you say success, I, I think of these images of Beatlemania, they're getting on and off the planes, or going mental. There's a famous interview with John Lennon where he's, he talks about seeing Elvis at the movies and going, that's a good job, you know. So I. I feel the same when I see the Beatles films. But because that's all history now, everybody knows that that sort of success um, gets very old for the people involved very quickly and that it actually drives them nuts. I did a tour with Nicky Sutton. We did one show in Chapel Hill and there was three people, it was a Monday night and there was three people in the audience. But those three guys were like fanatics, you know. They, were, they had their chins on the stage. You know, and the rest of the room is empty and they were, they knew every word to every song and they really had wild eyes and they put the whole band up in the hotel. We had nowhere to stay that night and they totally saved us. So I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily ask for such manic fans, but you know, a hundred people in each town that just appreciate you something. I don't think I'm the most ambitious person, but just being able to do what you want to do and being kind of left to it and being able to survive from it, you're doing great there because I think the majority of people in the world are not in that situation. To be on tour, to come into a town that you don't know anybody in and a hundred people show up and they know your music, they're glad that you've come to their town. I mean, I don't think that's ever really going to happen to me, you know, but uh, it's not a huge ambition, but I think that would be a really good feeling. What I would really like to do is be able to communicate in music and, and, and touch people the same way that I feel that I've been touched by music. To be able to transcend in music the sadder things in life. I think some of the, the, the best music that you ever hear is actually coming from quite a sad place, addresses it somehow and, and rises above it and makes something beautiful of it. I think that that is just the best thing that you can do in, in music. And that's what I'd like to do successful, well. You know. This is a song that I, I wrote, a uh, kind of folky song in the Scottish Catholic tradition. It's called Gil Ridden Blues.
my dear I still feel the shame over you compliments that I get. I'm proudest of when people consider me a good person. At the end of my life, I want my story to be a good story. Did I live a righteous life? Was I kind to people? Was I fair? Was I ambitious in the creative way but not the money way? That's what I hope people understand about me, that I keep a level of honesty. I mean, I'd like to save the world. <laughs> I would really like to save the world and bring world peace to everybody, but if I can't do that, then at least, you know, be a good person to whoever I meet. Normally, I have a lot of thoughts firing around in my brain all the time. They're very verbal. I'm not such a visual person. I'm more uh, thinking in words, pieces of conversation, conversations I'm having with myself. And then some phrase of what I'm thinking pops up louder and stronger than the rest. And I realize, oh, it's a line. It's the, the, the anchor that gets me started. And then I, I fill in the rest by asking myself as honestly as possible, what is it that you have to say about this? And by, by complete miracle, it comes to me in a melody. That's why I'm a musician and not a poet, that it just comes in music. An exercise in honesty, and then I call it chiseling the, the sentiment. Like you have to really get at what, what is it that you're saying? The first time I made an album was in Montreal with Lazarus Mo. They used to be called Little Buck. It was my first time in a real recording studio. And because it's a proper studio, there's a glass booth that you get to stand in when you're the singer, and you have headphones on. And so you start to play the song, and this is what's being recorded. And there was this totally mystical experience 
where in my headphones I could hear what the record would sound like as it was coming out of our bodies at the same moment and so it just had this complete like it blew my mind a little bit that I am gonna be a star <laughs> like it was just a, a beautiful nothing nothing tops the first time I like the musicians that can just jump in and have the skill to just play along really easily. The ones that talk about the soul that goes into making music. The least arrogant ones are the best ones. <laughs> yeah. I'm also arrogant sometimes. But yeah. When I was really young, people would say, Oh, you have a pretty voice, but we can't hear you, because I was so quiet. And then I learned to finally sing loud. But the, um, I hear, when I hear old recordings, the, the little moments where you could see the seed of what I was going to sound like later. I had the emotion there, but it was still really suppressed, and now I just, I don't care. I'm gonna give you all the emotion I have, if, if I have it. So it's not so rock and roll yet, but it's, it's, you know. If people aren't listening at all, if I'm playing in a noisy bar, and they're just bopping their head around or tapping their feet, they've already connected with it. They've already understood it on the most basic level, and if that's all that's happening that night, it's okay. There's moments and performances, especially the noisy places, that if they suddenly go quiet, there's this like, God, I got them, I got them. What makes music so beautiful is you don't have to understand the text at all to really sink into it. And the highest level of understanding my music is to really listen to the words and think about what I've written down, because that's, to me, the most important level. So um, there are some. There are some who really pay attention to this, and there are some who don't, and whatever level they can connect with is okay, that's why it's music. Bottom line of my goal is, if I'm writing songs, go play them for people, record albums, and in that sense, I'm making it as I go. I'm surviving eight years on the road without having to get another job. This is also kind of making it, but there's always room to, to grow, to reach uh, different audiences. If I, at some point in my life, play a theater with 200 people that come and know my music, this would be, of course, beautiful and wonderful. If I don't feel like I've made it now, then I have a problem. So I think the bottom line is I've made it. Anything else now is, is a total bonus. Success feels like, you know, at the end, at the end someone will hand you this award and says, you did it. Some kind of like official celebration of what you've done with your life, career and your music. This, this is a, a sweet sort of vision of what success will feel like at the end. I have a friend in Montreal who says, too stupid to quit. And I love this phrase because it's true. As much as I think about quitting, I really can't imagine stopping. So I don't know, I'm as curious as everybody else how long I'll keep doing it. I'm going to quote my friend Tom Lee, who, who wrote a beautiful song for his daughter. I'm going to sing until I die. Hopefully. <laughs> my heart is spoken for. Body is negotiable. My soul is not my own, my mind is mine, but sociable. History does not repeat, it's never even stopped. We just keep picking up where someone else has dropped and yet.
are just questions that have chosen a direction. Gestures are just needs we have reached for with our golden gloves. It's not that I'm accusing you, cause clearly I'm guilty too. But if we've got this chance, I'd rather go for romance. Words are spoken all the time. They're all we've really got. Though there are galaxies between what we said and what we thought, and though you say nice things to me, they're only borrowed lines. From every other person, every other time, and so. Speak with candid honesty, though we haven't got a 